So my name is Dina Temple Raston, and I cover terrorism for National Public Radio. And uh, the one person you haven't been introduced to is Peter Bergen, but I'm sure uh, for those of you who follow terrorism at all, he's a familiar face. He is, uh, let's see if I can get your title right, co-director of the Counterterrorism Strategy Initiative. Did I get that right? Excellent. Yep. At the New America uh, Foundation. You may also recognize him from CNN. Whenever something happens, the smartest uh, person who's telling you and putting it in context is usually Peter Bergen. So we have a, a great panel here this evening. I wanted to start out by focusing a little bit on the film, though, Carrie. And you know, as someone who occasionally wittingly or unwittingly talks to terrorists, as I do in my job, um, I always want to know what's going on behind the scenes. So can you give me an idea of how it is that you came to meet Ashraf. I'm, I'm guessing you met him at the UN, and, and how you got him to do the film? Well, it wasn't hard to get Ashraf to do the film. I, I don't know if you can tell from the movie, Ashraf likes to talk. So he has no problems with telling you exactly what's on his mind. And as he said at the end of the movie, he's willing to go anywhere and do just about anything uh, to get his story out there. And I once was joking with him and said to him, maybe we have to do like Bin Laden did and go hide in a cave. This is when we thought he was still in a cave. And I said, Ashraf, we'll just put you in a cave for a few months and you can pop out and make statements every now and then. He was keen to do it, but his wife, Nadia, was not so keen. So. Yeah. But he's an amazing man. And I mean, you can see his story is so compelling. And it's very hard for anyone to counter it. I mean, you saw Zaid wasn't willing to meet him. He's willing to say anything, but he wouldn't meet a victim of the crimes that he likes to How did you come to meet him and, and get him to do the film? I mean, what, what exactly transpired? In that well, way? we had the right, you're a reporter, so you know it's all about the fixers you have. And so we had the right people in Jordan, a woman named Rania, who whose voice you get to hear. She's the translator speaking Arabic when she's talking to Zaid. And she knows everyone. And so she tried to get Zaid's boss, but the Jordanian intelligence ministry didn't want us to do that. So instead, she went to Zaid's mom's house and had a lot of coffee and cookies with Zaid's mom. And finally, she said, do you want to meet Zaid? And we thought he was in jail, but it turns out he wasn't. So he came, and he was very happy to talk. As you can see, he also has no problem with sending, uh, telling you what he thinks. And what's interesting about Zaid is when he showed up, normally he's dressed in regular street clothes, just like Ashraf. But when he came for the interview, which was held in Rania's house, he came you know, all phobed out and traditional, and he brought a minder with him who filmed our film crew filming him, but they weren't so prepared, so their battery ran out halfway through. And he actually insisted that Rania, even though it was within, in her own home, and, and Rania does dress quite provocatively for a Jordanian woman, he insisted that she cover herself and stand behind our director, who was a man. So she's asking him questions and he can't, without line of sight. And, and was he very concerned about the way that he looked on camera? I've, I've found that that, yes. it, for some reason, they're very vain. And uh, did you find that in yes. this case, too? Yeah, he, he definitely cared about the image that he was putting out there. And what's interesting now is, unfortunately, he's MIA. No one knows where Zaid is. So he actually doesn't know he's part of an Academy Award-nominated film, which I think he might like to know. You send him a note or an email or <laughs> yeah, something. I'll yes, try. Exactly. Go to his mom. So did he only want you to shoot him from the left-hand side, like Barbara Streisand, <laughs> or was he, was he not that picky? Not that picky. OK. Um, and. Um, one of the themes that, uh, that I, th I thought that your film gave us an opportunity to talk about is, is the narrative. I mean, we've talked about Osama bin Laden being killed, and there are some themes that have come up again and again in this, in this uh, uh, conference so far. But we haven't really talked about narrative. And, and I think what's interesting about your film is that it provides one narrative, which is, which is the victim's narrative. And that's a new narrative that, that you're using to try and change the story. But I, I also wonder when we're talking so much about narrative, whether or not there are other narratives that we could use. And, and by that I mean, there was one part in the film, I've sort of had a bee in my bonnet for some time about trying to use uh, reform jihadists in films like yours. And I thought your film was gonna go there the first time I saw it, and, and wondered if in fact the man in Indonesia, if, if he is willing to do something like that, and do a film like that to try and explain. I'm sure he would. And you might know that Google actually just sponsored a summit against violent extremism and brought what they called formers, which are former extremists, together. But they also brought survivors with them. And we got sort of left behind. And I think that that's a theme you'll see a lot. We always talk about the terrorists. We very rarely talk about the victims of their crimes. And I think if we're going to make an impact, we need to start telling those stories, too. And I sort of liken it to an opposition party. So if the Republicans say something, the Democrats get a chance to have a rebuttal, and vice versa. But when it comes to terrorism, we don't do that. We just let the terrorists own the microphone. 
And you know, very rarely do we get one as a victim. It'll be, you know, on the 10th commemoration of 9-11, sure, we'll get a, how are you now? But other than that, we don't get a chance to say, wait a second, what you're saying isn't right. And that's what Ashraf is trying to do, for example, in that school, where those kids, those Indonesian students, they've never seen an Indonesian victim of terrorism. And they're being taught all these things about people in other lands who are suffering really poorly. You know, they're having these terrible lives. They don't know anything concrete. And then we show them Ibu Endang. And now they have to see a woman who speaks their language, who has their own religion. And yeah, you hear the one kid say, well, she suffers not as greatly as other people. But if you look at the faces of the other students, and I have to admit, I've seen the film a few times, and you start to see all the, pick up the other things, you can tell something's changed in the way that they look at Ashraf and the way that they started to watch that video of Ibu Ending. I think that's how we make a difference in the next generation. Now, I also wonder, though, if, if in fact you had had one of these people who were reformed in the film as well, whether that would have had traction with some of the young men, because they have the glib answer, and I've heard it when yeah. I've been in madrasas, which is, um, well, so many Muslims have died, so, and, and the Americans or you know, the Crusaders have killed so many Muslims. If more Muslims die, they'll go straight to heaven. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if that's another narrative that we might tease out that 10 years after 9-11, we still haven't figured out a way to try and um, diffuse this. I and victims is one way, and I think, I think performers narrative. may be another way. I wanted to get you in here, Peter. I think one of the things that we've been talking about a lot uh, in sort of glancing ways is Awlaki, um, Anwar Awlaki. Um, he was referred to earlier in one of the uh, sessions as the leader of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP. He, in fact, is not. He's just a member. He's not a leader. He, we just think he is because he speaks English and we can understand him. And um, a certain network, rhymes with CMN, CNN, had once said uh, that he was going to be the next bin Laden. Do, do you see him that way? No, I mean, you know, um, Al Anki uh, lived in the United States and Virginia and California, and uh, he's never fought in a battle, he's never been in prison, which are two kind of important kind of things you want on your resume if you want to be a big leader. And you know, the fact is we know about him because he speaks English. He's almost unknown in the Middle East, so he, he's not going to be, be the next bin Laden. But I just wanted to say something just to pick up on this uh, former jihadi point, which I think is quite important. You know, there's a sort of emerging jihadist critique of al-Qaeda, which is something that al-Qaeda has a very hard time countering. And uh, to give you, uh, there are many examples, but one that is uh, pretty interesting is a guy called Salman al Auda, who is a leading Saudi religious scholar, who um, inspired bin Laden in his youth um, to basically to turn against the United States. Now, Salman al Auda has uh, spent years in Saudi prison. He's a major religious scholar, and he very publicly came out six years after 9 11 and he condemned bin Laden by name. And we've had lots of Muslim clerics who said 9 11 is wrong or terrorism is wrong, but very few have had the courage to say bin Laden is actually immoral. Um, and Al-Qaeda's response to this is to say, say nothing. And when they say nothing, that's because they don't, you know, they don't really know how to respond. So I think you know, th that's a story that I think, you know, agreeing with you, that, that I think has not been fully processed in the West, that many of the people who have been fighting in these jihads have turned against. It's not just ordinary Muslims or Muslim clerics. It's also people with a lot of jihadist credentials. With street cred. And, and I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, an HBO movie called Terror in Mumbai, which is one of the best terrorism movies I've ever seen. Uh, it, it actually has behind the scenes footage of what was going on in the hotel when uh, the young men were spreading out there and their comms back and forth with the leaders in Pakistan. But what really struck me about the movie was that there was a uh, one survivor from the uh, LET group that basically laid siege to the country. And they had all these uh, sort of on his hospital bed, they talked to him about what he had done. And he kept on saying, well, this was good. The LET told me to do this. I'm being a good Muslim. And then they had the brilliant idea of actually taking him down to the morgue where his nine other compatriots were. And when they took him down to the morgue, he was shocked because they weren't bathed in a gold glow and they didn't have a big smile on their face. And he had been told by LET that when they died, that is what they were going to look like. And it was the first time he realized, after all these interviews that he was having with the Indians about what he had done wrong, it was the first time he realized that L.E.T. had sold him a bill of goods. Now, of course, he's been uh, convicted in uh, India, and they're going to put him to death. And I think he would be a great candidate 
to be taken into madrasas like the one that, uh, maybe not necessarily in Indonesia, but take him into a similar madrasa in Pakistan and have him talk about being sold a bill of goods, that is going to have a lot of traction because he was there, he has the street cred. And I think there are people here in this country too that can do that. The Lackawanna Six are now out of prison and uh, they could be going to these at-risk youth in Dearborn or these other places and doing that. And I'm wondering if that's the way we change the narrative. And I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to see that the White House is going to try and do something like that when they talk about their new counter-radicalization counter policy. Do you think it could work? Well, I think in this country, um, you know, it, it, it has worked in Indonesia, and it has worked to some degree in Saudi Arabia. Um, it hasn't worked in Yemen. I mean, sort of country by country. And the problem that, but I, I, I think, you know, the Lackawanna Six is a very interesting idea because uh, they, you know, they, um, you, you wrote the book literally about them. Um, and, um, you know, they would have, I think, some credibility. They did go to Afghanistan. They did meet bin Laden. Uh, I think they have a pretty powerful story to tell. Um, there are just more of those kinds of people in places like Indonesia and Saudi Arabia, and there's a more organized counter-radicalization program in these countries. So um, how do we, as, as as we hear more and more about Awlaki and as we, we see more and more English language sort of narrative out there, the pro-Al-Qaeda narrative, how do we counter that? I think it's, I, I think it's being countered by itself. I mean, first, I mean, there's several problems with, who do you mean by how do we counter it? Is that the US government? Um, is that civil society? I mean, I, I think there's, there's a problem with the US government, with the kiss of death problem, the lack of knowledge problem, you know, there's a few problems. Ten years after 9-11. Kiss of death and lack of knowledge? Well, and, you know, we're not Islamic scholars, mostly in the US government. <laughs> and, um, so I think that, I mean, you can engage, I think, you know, th there's a very simple message the US government can make. It's like basically the message of, of your film, which is these guys have killed mostly Muslim civilians. And we just relentlessly hammer on that as, as a US government. I think that's okay. But trying to get into some sort of debate about the meaning of jihad uh, as a U.S. government, I don't think it's practicable. But I mean, it's just sort of zooming out for a minute. Uh, you know, these folks have been losing the war of ideas in the Muslim world for a very long time, long before the Arab Spring and the death of bin Laden. If you look at polling data in Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Pakistan, support for Al Qaeda, bin Laden, suicide bombing has evaporated. Why? Because Muslims aren't stupid. They read the newspapers and they see that most of the victims are Muslim civilians. Um, and West Point has done an incredibly powerful study of Arab language news accounts of, of terrorist attacks in the Arab world and, you, and, and shown that overwhelmingly the Arab language news accounts of these attacks are uh, overwhelmingly the victims are, 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 are civilians. So, you know, I, I think that this debate has already been won to some degree in the Muslim world yeah, in, in a sense. So I don't think many, no, no one's buying a, a, a future where they're going to be governed by something like the Taliban. No one wants that. Um, and uh, I think that they, they, their time is, you know, President Obama's called them small man on the wrong side of history. And, you know, history has just sped up for them, but it was already not looking so good even before the Arab Spring and the death of bin Laden. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm not, you paint probably maybe a rosier picture, and you obviously know much more about this than I ever will learn, but having shown the film and going around and talking to people, I find just being there and telling them the realities of terrorism tends to change people's mind pretty quickly. People don't know a lot of what it means to be a terrorism victim. So I showed this film in the UK to some former convicts, so guys who got out of prison, who got radicalized in prison. And we watched the film and we discussed it. And then one, at the end, one of the guys said, well, hold on a second. You said your mom was on one of the planes on 9-11? And I said, yeah, she was on the first plane that hit the World Trade Center. He said, but we were taught that there were no people in the planes. And his whole face changed. And I didn't need to tell him, you've been lied to, they've sold you a bill of goods. I didn't need to say a thing. That was it. It was done. And he went home that night, and I found out he went and told his friends, you're not going to believe I met someone, and this is what happened, and we've been lied to, and da-da-da-da. And you can see how it, it falls from there. That it, the house of cards that all this rhetoric he'd been taught crumbles immediately. And the same thing's going to happen when people meet someone like Ashraf or someone like Ibu Ending, and, and it goes on and on. And so I... I think you have to get those stories out there, but right now a lot of those stories aren't told when, and no offense to the media, but when these attacks are reported, it's numbers. It's 17 people killed in Pakistan. Instead of a guy who was at a school and a university got blown up when the university was blown up. He went outside, severely burned, his skin was coming off, and people weren't sure if he was the terrorist 
or an innocent person, so nobody helped him. And he finally got to go to the hospital because his friends recognized him somehow. And they didn't want to treat him because they said he was going to die anyway. And so they had him lying there, morphine, with no morphine and complete pain. And he could hear and feel everything, and he knew everyone had given up on him. Where did this happen? This is in Pakistan. So if you tell that story and you go tell kids this is what happens when people get blown up, that's different than saying 17 people got killed in the university yesterday and 45 were injured. Right. And we need to get those stories out there to teach them the realities of it, because otherwise it's really hard to counter it. Can you talk, Peter, a little bit about radicalization and, and, and how it happens? I think so that's ask, I mean, I, I think that's a, you know, it's like why, why do people become criminals? It's, I think it's a very hard thing to disentangle. I mean, the best work that has been done on it is Mark Sageman's uh, first book. You know, and he really talks about a sort of group, basically sort of a group process where people sort of, they're usually friends or sometimes family members who kind of join the jihad together. Um, you know, there's sort of a certain jihadi cool aspect to some of this. Uh, you know, in my, I think in this country, for instance, when people adopt these ideas, often they, they're sort of losers, and often, not always, but, um, and, you know, for 30 years ago, they would have become members of the Weather Underground or the Black Panthers, but since those ideas are sort of now defunct, you know, if you want to act out against the American government um, and you want to give your life some meaning, this is kind of a way to, that helps you do it, and I think that, you know, that's my amateur kind of psychology uh, uh, of, of why people do this, but I mean, I think it's very individual. I mean, at the same time that you have somebody like Jihad Jane, who was a high school dropout, three marriages under her belt, you know, she was going nowhere. You also have Major Nadal Hassan, who's a you know, medical doctor and earning $90,000 a year and a major in the US military. So, you know, what are, the, what are the commonalities between these two people? And the answer is really not very much. I don't think you can also, by the way, discount that the role of religion, which is an uncomfortable uh, sometimes, but I, I mean, to say this has got nothing to do with Islam would be saying like the Crusades have got nothing to do with Christianity. I think, you know, just look at Zaid in this film. You know, he is a true believer, um, you know, who believes that Ashraf's family is actually in heaven, right? <laughs> I mean, th that is not a not sort of totally rational belief. Um, and I think that is to do with religion. And I think that you can't take away certain religious beliefs from this picture. Not always. Some of these people are, I think Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was not a religious person. Um, you know, he had girlfriends in the Philippines, the operational commander in 9 11. Um, and he was in it, I think, just because it was glamorous and exciting. So, you know, there's no individual response, an individual, there's, there's no kind of unified field theory. But I, I do, I think that to discount religion would be a mistake. I wanted to switch the subject a little bit to talk about something, another one of the themes that has come up in the conference so far, and that has to do with um, what Admiral Olson called um, Al Qaeda 2.0, which I'm not sure any of us, or maybe we're 2.0A or something now, but um, it, it has to do with how Al Qaeda has changed. And today, um, some people who are in the news media may know this, but there was actually uh, someone who was arrested. Uh, he was an AWOL Muslim army officer who had uh, decided, he, he left uh, his base in Kentucky and decided to go to uh, Fort Hood, Texas and shoot up Fort Hood again in this sort of copycat of the Hassan uh, shooting. And he happened to go to the very same gun store that Hassan had gone to and he bought a gun there and he, uh, he uh, bought some gunpowder there. And uh, the guy who was running the store thought, hmm, this seems kind of familiar. And he called the police and said, there's kind of a weird guy who was here. I'm a little worried. And they found him in his hotel room, uh, apparently with bomb making materials and the gun and a big plan to, to blow up, uh, or, or at least to shoot people in, in Fort Hood. Is that Al Qaeda 2.0? Is that the new concern that the United States has to be worried about? If that's our biggest concern, you know, we can, I mean, in a way, that's good news. Um, because, I mean, as Admiral Blair said on this stage earlier, I mean, 17 Americans have died in jihadi terrorist attacks since 9-11 in this country, which is more Americans die in their bathtubs every year. Um, and so... <laughs> What's that figure? I, I don't know. It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's, not, it's not particularly large. <laughs> uh, so the point is, is that I think we're going to look back on this period as a time of basically, you know, we may look back on this as, uh, with some nostalgia as a time of relative tranquility. Um, 
I mean, if we'd had this conversation two, year, uh, two years after 9-11, it would not have been predictable that only, there were only 17 Americans would have died in a jihadi terrorist attack. And uh, we at the New America Foundation have looked at all the jihadi terrorist cases since 9-11, um, and one of the other uh, unpredictable things is not a single one of the cases involves chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons as part of the charges against these 180 individuals. So, you know, if this is Al-Qaeda 2.0 and this guy, I mean, he sounds like he was a serious threat. He wasn't an informant-driven case, as many of these cases have been. But at the end of the day, this is not that big a deal. And I do think that um, if we get attacked by, with somebody having a radiological bomb, it's much more likely to come out of the right-wing movement uh, than it is to come out of jihadi terror. In fact, there have been quite a lot of radiolog radiological cases in, uh, coming out of the right-wing movement since 9-11, uh, at least three or four that I'm aware of. So, you know, just as it was a mistake to be, to, under, to underestimate the Al-Qaeda threat, I think we've kind of overestimated the Al-Qaeda threat now. And there will be other forms of political violence, as we saw in Norway, which can be pretty worrisome. And you know, one day, radical vegetarians armed with nuclear weapons will <laughs> attack us. So, anyway, but, uh, you know, so I just think to focus only on Al-Qaeda is a mistake. Um, and just to hit on this theme of, of, of narrative one more time, I think one of the things we've also heard in the conference has to do with the fact that, that Americans react to attacks generally in the same way, whether they work or they don't work. And that this is one of the concerns that Al-Qaeda will figure out that really all you need is one guy with a gun to shoot people in a mall to get the same sort of impact. And, and I don't mean to, belittle, uh, to, to minimize 9-11 at all, but if you can see Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber, his bomb was never going to go off, and how much coverage he got for a bomb that never went off. I, I wonder how uh, we can inure Americans to being prepared that these things are going to happen, and that if we overreact to them, it actually makes their case work better. Well, we need leadership in that. I mean, one thing I would have loved to ask um, TSA administrator today is how come at a checkpoint, there is nothing that empowers the people going through that checkpoint to be part of the solution. So what ends up happening is they don't For like example, the For example, I'm sorry, empowers them. Well, it makes them, them realize that this is an issue we all have to deal with. The bad guy is not the guy who's making you take off your shoe. The bad guy is the one who put the bombs in his shoe before and is making us all go through this. And that guy who's making you take your shoe off is actually doing it on your behalf because, unfortunately, the threat is very real. So keep your eyes and ears open because when we're in this together, we can solve it. But that's, that's not the message we get. Instead, we're, we're treated as if it has to happen to us. You know, security happens to us. I have to do these things. Instead of, I'm going to go through this process, and I'm going to keep my eyes and ears open. And I don't know, maybe I'm that person at the airport that does do that. And I talk to the TSOs, the, the security screeners, and say, hey, what's going on? Or what about this or that? And engage with them because I know that, one, they need it. And two, I need it because I need to know what's going on. And we don't have leadership in this country that is really willing to embrace that. And I think it's a shame because Personally, I mean, it sounds cheesy, but I believe in the American people, and I think they can handle that the threat is very real. But instead, we either get, well, someone was supposed to take care of us, and they didn't do their job right, so they're bad, which isn't generally the case. Or, you know, we, we're not going to worry about that threat. It's not very real. And I, I just don't think that those are the two right answers. I think it's very hard for politicians to say the following three kind of linked propositions, all of which are true, and I appear to be slightly in tension with each other. One is Al Qaeda is not 10 feet tall. Two, we are doing a great deal to make you, you the public, safe. Uh, and three, by the law of averages, they will get one through. Um, I mean, that, these are all true statements that are very hard for a politician to say because what, you know, what if something really catastrophic happens? But that's where we are today. And in fact, I think as a general proposition, we're now 10 years from 9 11. And 9 11 was a national security failure and a national security threat to the United States. Can Al-Qaeda Al produce something that is a na really a national security problem in a sense that we would change our entire foreign policy and in a sense almost change many parts of the way that we live? And the answer surely is no. I mean, they can't possibly do that now. I mean, it's, it, but for a politician, that is just a very hard thing to say. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm glad that Mike Leiter today, I think, used a very good word, which I've heard twice in this conference. Uh, the word is resiliency. You know, I mean, if, ter if, if we're not terrorized, then terrorists are not succeeding. And uh, you know, one way to achieve that is um, if you have constant terrorist attacks, you can kind of, you know, people get inured to that. We're obviously, we don't want that. <laughs> uh, 
But you know, if we, if we had this sort of zero tolerance for even kind of failed attempts, as we've seen, um, I, I, you know, that's a pretty bad situation to be, to be in. Um, and I think there is sort of leadership required to sort of make some of these points. Um, I, I don't think that President Obama has ever given a kind of terrorism speech. You know, he has talked about terrorism in particular, and, and there's all sorts of reasons for that, um, I think. Um, but, you know, I think that kind of speech would be useful to say. I would agree, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, we all know that things can happen to us. When, when we're kids, we learn stop, drop, and roll, right? If you catch on fire, you stop, drop, and roll. You learn, you're going to have to go to the dentist twice a year. You learn all these things, but we don't talk about what do you do if something really bad happens. There's, you know, in our schools, we don't have any drills for, you know, God forbid, if there is a WMD attack, and the reality is most people wouldn't handle it right. Parents would go straight to the school, which in most cases, you wouldn't want them out anyway, and I think one thing we could do as a society is teach ourselves, train ourselves how to handle these threats because then they're not as scary and then we're empowered and that's a completely different role to be in than to be a victim. And I think we can make that change if we wanted to but we haven't seen that happen yet. I wanted to open this up to questions. If I could, do we have uh, microphone people as they're commonly known? Right here, please. <laughs> So if you what, could identify uh, yourself, please. My name is Deborah Rosemary. Um, what disturbed me is, is that the movie seemed, is this on? The movie yeah. seemed geared towards it's, it's wrong to kill Muslims as victims, but it's okay to kill anybody else. Would you comment on that? We get that comment a lot. Ah, I, um, and I can see how you would think that a lot of what they say may be distasteful to a Western audience. There's a couple of things. One is this wasn't necessarily made for a Western audience. First of all, Westerners don't like subtitles. And I know you guys had to read a lot tonight. I feel bad. I should have told you to take out your glasses. But um, you can imagine that a lot of the people Ashraf is speaking to, that is what they think. And that's the reality on the ground. And so we have to start off in a place that was a shared space, which is, yes, that's, that's what we're going to talk about. And as distasteful as it may seem to us, in order to gain any ground there, that's the conversation that needed to ha ha happen. Now, if we could get to a world where everyone agreed we're not going to kill Muslims, I'd love to be in that world and then start from there to get beyond that. But the fact is we're not even in that world yet. And that's what's really sad. So, yeah. By the way, just one quick thing here. Uh, you know, Ayman al-Zawari, who's now the leader of al-Qaeda, was became aware that this killing of Muslim civilians was really becoming a huge problem. And we also now, by the way, Bin Laden himself was kind of aware of this from the materials that have been recovered in Abbottabad. And Ayman al-Zawari um, took the unusual step of, uh, of soliciting something like 4,000 questions from over the internet. Um, it took them several months to respond. And he took uh, questions that were pretty, that clearly came from people who were supportive, but were uh, you know, puzzled by how can you justify this? And Ayman al-Zawari didn't really have any good responses. I mean, he kind of answered in very dense, passages and refer people to other dense passages he'd, have, uh, he, he'd made about this issue. And so for, for Al-Qaeda, this issue is something they just really do not have good answers for because, you know, it's pretty obvious in the Quran that civilians are entitled to not be killed even in times of holy war. Um, and, uh, and that is not just Muslim civilians, but any uh, people of the book. So, uh, you know, this is their huge Achilles heel. And, uh, I mean, this film, I think, is really... Brilliant. I mean. Thank you. And I should caveat, Ashraf doesn't just think that, by the way. You know, Ashraf obviously thinks no one should get killed. And he's a very close friend of mine now. So I don't want to, people have come up to me saying, oh, how can you be around him if that's what he thinks? And that's not what he thinks. He's just setting a conversation. Other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the young lady in the white there? Thank you. One of the if you could identify Oh, yourself, I'm sorry. My name right. is Joan Newhouse Shaw, and I'm with the Baker Institute for Public Policy. Um, one of the details that caught my attention was the father saying that his hand had been chained to the steering wheel. And that brings to mind Burhan Hassan, who was from Minneapolis, who wanted to come home and was probably killed by Al Shabaab. Um, it's by, it, okay, go ahead. And yeah. by the other young lady in Iraq who had been drugged by her sister and brother-in-law and then covered in suicide vests. So I was wondering if you thought that also that kind of revelation about how some of the suicide 
bombers are motivated or not, or not motivated, tricked into becoming attackers um, is handled. Um, just the Burhan Hassan story, because I, I, I did a lot on the Minneapolis Somali kids for NPR. Um, he, he was caught in crossfire in Mogadishu uh, during a very violent time in which I think four or five of the kids who had left Minneapolis were all sort of killed in the space of two weeks. Um, and there was some question as to whether or not he was shot because he was trying to get out of uh, Shabab and theoretically go to the Kenyan embassy and meet his parents or his, his mother and his uncle. Um, and it's very unclear what actually happened to Burhan. Um, but there was uh, another Minneapolis kid, Shirwa Ahmed, who was the first U uh, American suicide bomber ever, who uh, about, I guess in 2007, I think, or maybe, yeah, 2007, actually drove a car bomb into a UN compound in uh, Somaliland, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he was chained to the, uh, to the steering wheel. So uh, it, it's the same point, just a, a slightly different person. And, and now let me give it to you. Jennifer. Well, I think, you know, in this case, um, for Raed, no one really knows. You know, that was one report on the internet whether or not he had his hand chained. But, you know, I would go back to Ashraf's point. Well, at some point, he knew where he was going and knew he was not going there to hand out lollipops. Um, so I think regardless of the end state, the point that Ashraf is trying to make is what was your son doing and why was he doing it? And do you want to contribute to that? And obviously Mansoor, the father, has, is really struggling. And you know, I think that's one of the hardest scenes in the film to watch. It was the hardest scene to film because you feel for him. He lost his son. And, and it's a pretty terrible thing. And, and I would agree with you that getting those stories out there are important because there's a lot of you know, so-called victims in this scenario. There was also the grandmother who had young girls raped, so they would then be chosen. They could either be killed by stoning or become a martyr because they had been raped. I mean, there are a lot of instances like that um, or where a young person is approached and they're led to believe members of their family are going to be killed or wiped out if they don't do as they're told. Yeah, this was not the case with Rod. You know, he, there was no sort of blackmail, if you will, going on. He, he went voluntarily. By the way, a small note about him. He actually tried to get into the United States, I believe, in early 2003, and was turned back, I think, at an airport in Chicago mm -hmm. uh, by a kind of alert customs uh, uh, inspector who apparently there were multiple reasons that he just wasn't allowed into he the country. He overstayed his visa previously. He had had so much fun in L.A. He spent time in Los Angeles. He overstayed his visa, and when he tried to come back in, he was turned away. Uh, and that's when things started to go downhill for him. Other questions? Uh, I can vaguely see a blue sleeve in the back there. That's there you go. Uh, Faisal Ali Khan from um, Pakistan. I live and work in the frontier province and in the tribal area. I just had a comment. Um, I think what you're doing, Carrie, is something very, uh, very, very important in terms of challenging the narrative and coming from a country where we have thousands and thousands of victims post 9-11 of terrorist attacks. Um, there's very few that actually come out to challenge the narrative or to be out there and you know, making this sort of difference and connecting all the dots of all the different countries. Um, and I think it leads to you know, inspiring others in other countries to do, to do the same. So I just wanted to you know, thank you for the work you're doing and for you to know that it's something that's very important and seen in other places and will motivate others to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you know, you're being very modest in some of the work that you do, reaching out to people who have been radicalized and, and getting them through a de-radicalization process. And I would be remiss in saying, you know, we've launched a lot of other videos. So we've released a series of five videos of Pakistani victims telling their story. In fact, you can hear the story that I just told you about, the gentleman who was injured in the university bombing. And those got into the Cannes Film Festival. So we're trying to get out there, getting more stories told, because it, it really is remarkable that you know, around the globe, there are people suffering from this kind of violence, and it's senseless. And for them to get their voices is, is something that's so difficult, but it's so important. So we're trying hard, but we have a lot more work to do. Question there on the side. Perfect. Carolyn Lepton, um, how at risk is Ashrif and the people who come out? And how at risk are you? 
from well, being... Uh, hopefully not that at risk. I'm an Aspen, I've been told. <laughs> Although I did have, I ran into a bear yesterday, and that was quite terrifying. Um, a jihadi bear. I, no, a very hungry bear. It was, there were leaves, and he was focused. But, uh, you know, Ashraf thinks he's not at risk, and if you ask Ashraf what he will say is, they already killed my whole family, practically. You know, what do I have to be afraid of? Of course, now Hala, who you saw in the movie, is, she turns five this month, in August. And Khaled was born in April, his son. So his family is growing. So there, there is something to lose. And obviously Nadia, too. And, and Ashraf's mom is still alive. But I think Ashraf feels a duty and a calling to speak out on behalf of you know, 27 members of his family. I, I think it, you, you almost can't fathom the pain of having your wedding blown up because everyone you love is at your wedding. And I was actually in Amman this past November 9th, which was the five-year commemoration. And we didn't have a big event because it turned out the Jordanians planned their election that day, and you don't do big events when there's an election. So it was a very small commemorative ceremony at the memorial. And it was so sad because Nadia's best friend, who was her bridesmaid, was just learning how to walk again. And so much of their family isn't there on their, it's not really their anniversary because it's the day both her parents died and the day Ashraf's dad died. And and it's just so tragic to go through their wedding album. And it's almost like watching people walk to their death because you know what's going to happen. And halfway through the wedding album, there's just no more photos. Mm. And it's just the rest of it's empty. So I think he feels compelled to get out there and speak out. And he's fearless, probably more so than anyone I've ever met. Nadia and I, we hesitate a little bit. I'm not going to send him to Afghanistan or to Iraq because I don't think he would be safe there. So. Um, in that sense, you know, he's too busy working and doing everything else to make the plans. Well, what does he do for a living? Does he do something normal for a living? Or yeah, he's a medical uh, sales rep. <laughs> so if you need any medical supplies, Ashraf's your dad. <laughs> <laughs> he's very good at what he does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, his house looked like it was fairly affluent and, and that he was living quite comfortably. Yeah, he's doing okay, but it's yeah. tough. You know, he's got two little ones, and he's got a whole family now. He's got to take care of his mom, and you know, there's a lot on his shoulders, but he handles it very well. Uh, yes, up here in the front. Other than I should say he smokes like a chimney, so I do worry about like that. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Dave Trulio. Uh, when we were speaking earlier yesterday, just one-on-one, -on -one, we, we talked about the, the need for resources to further your work. Uh, there are a lot of people in this room who are deeply sympathetic to what you're doing, would probably like to help. H how, how can people help? Well, that's like a setup. No. Um, Yes, of course we need resources. It's very hard to do the work we do, and obviously movies don't come cheap. Um, and so I spend the vast majority of my time fundraising, which isn't really the most fun part. But it needs to happen, and it's the reality. And I think you know, a lot of NGOs are in that situation. I'm sure, Faisal, you can relate to that in Pakistan as well. It is not easy to get out there, but we feel compelled. So we're going to keep trying. Is there something other than money, though, that, I mean, obviously money is, is crucially important, but, but I don't know, in kind, this or that. Yeah, if there are any airline uh, representatives, I think that's the vast majority of our spending is on travel. <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to say, yes, just give us goods or um, different services because basically what we're using is the moral authority we have as terrorism victims and survivors. Is there and a, a website or something that people can go to? Yeah, globalsurvivors.org is our website, and we've got a Facebook page. I'm trying out this Twitter thing. Um, yeah, no, we're out there. We're trying hard, but again, as I say, it's the moral authority, and that's not something you can buy. And that's why it's hard for me to just say someone can go ahead and do something else other than giving us a platform to speak, which is what we're trying to do. Any other questions? Sorry, are there? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, dark sleeves. No, uh, thank you, uh, Jeff Stern with the Homeland Security Institute. Thank all three of you for your work in educating the public on these issues. Uh, you showed in the film almost two different pathways toward radicalization. One was lifelong indoctrination in the matrices and the, the deep, devout religion. And one was a very quick one-month radicalization. I know the New York Police Department had done a study several years ago that looked at very fast pathways to radicalization, how it's done. You're telling the story of survivors as one method of countering radicalization. What are some of the other ways that we're finding that are successful to counter radicalize what could happen either over the lifelong uh, indoctrination in the madrasas or other religious uh, uh, methods or this 
very fast kind of radicalization that may have to do with the culture, the idea of uh, uh, jihad or martyrdom being a way to, to honor oneself if one's, you know, something has gone wrong with their family or they feel dishonored, et cetera. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Do you want to take that one, Peter? Well, I mean, I think that it's it, survivor stories and I think former jihadi, so these are the two most powerful ways to, to counter the narrative. Yeah, I think creating a community where it's not acceptable. Right. And, and I guess that, just in closing this, because we've sort of run out of time, um, I guess that's what we'd like you to walk away with, is this idea that, that there are threads of narrative here that, that Kerry is addressing one, and, and Peter, with some of the work he does, is addressing another. And there, there are other possibilities, I think, that the White House is looking at in addressing this, so that um, they don't get to control the message and that the message is, is in fact, um, more diffuse and, and people have choices and can hear different messages. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks, you guys.